scripture reading this morning is from Luke 4, 16 to 21, NIV version. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Acting United Methodist Church. It's good to see everyone here this morning. My name is Wade. I'm the lead pastor of the church. If you are a guest of ours today, we're so thankful that you are here this morning. We also want to make sure that we welcome those who are worshiping with us online. So welcome to you as well. And if you're here with us regularly, thank you for being back with us. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are choosing to rejoice and be glad in it. So we're glad that everyone is here this morning. When you walked in, you received your worship guide, and I invite you to turn to the back, and you'll see some announcements that are coming up. I'm not going to go over all of those, but I do want to point that out to you. So if you haven't taken a look at it, you can see some things that are going on that we want you to be a part of. You can also fill out that tear-off sheet and drop it in the offering plate to sign up for anything. Two things in particular, or a couple of things in particular that I want to bring up include People Matter Sunday. Today is People Matter Sunday. And so when you go into the gym area, you'll see a lot of tables and displays set up from different classes, from different groups, from different ministry areas that we want you to go in and mix and mingle and see what's going on in the life of the church. We're human, and so we think the only thing that are going on, the only things that are going on are the things that we know about. We kind of get in our own little silo. And we're focusing today that people matter. And so we want you to go into the gym and see what's going on. And if you're not already plugged in with something, please get plugged in with something. When those of you who have joined the church, when you made the vow to support the church, you chose to support the church with your prayers, with your presence, with your giving, with your serving, and with your witnessing. And so if you do not have a way to plug in in any of those ways, including the serving, today's the day because people matter. And the reason that people matter to us is because people matter to Jesus. So please make your way into the gym before you leave today. Also tonight, for those of you who have been a guest of the church for a while, we have a new partner dinner that's taking place in the education building. You'll see that information there in your worship guide. Also this coming Wednesday, we have our last Methodist 101 class or So what's been going on with United Methodist Church? If we have your email, you should have received an email from me on Friday about what's been going on or what is going on this weekend. And we don't want you to hear stuff in the media that you have no context for. We don't want you to have conversations with one another that you really have no idea what's going on. And so we want to encourage you to come on Wednesday, either the morning session or the evening session, and to come and hear what we've been talking about over for the last six weeks. There's been over 200 of us that have really been processing this, and we would love for you to come. If this is the first time you've heard about it, or the first time that you've actually kind of plugged in that something's going on, you're welcome. We would love for you to be there on Wednesday. Also, I want to let you know that our executive lay leadership team meets on Thursday, and our executive lay leadership team is our administrative council. It's our strategic body. And when we meet on Thursday, it's a regular meeting. We're wanting to let you know these meetings are taking place, but also want to let you know that on Thursday, we're not making any decision based on what happens or doesn't happen at the special Methodist meeting that's taking place in St. Louis. So I just want you to know that. The executive lay leadership team is going to need time to process and understand what's going on. So we still have other things that we're talking about other than the meeting in St. Louis. So if you want to attend to that, we would love for you to attend that. But if you're expecting fireworks, you're probably not going to get any because we're not quite there yet to do that. But just want to let you know on that. 
You'll also see that with, uh, with March coming up, that, well, you won't see it. It's actually going to be on the screen. We have a new sermon series that's beginning next Wednesday or next Sunday for the month of March, and it's called Transitions. I know that each and every one of us love transitions and change. Amen? Yeah, so we're going to spend five weeks talking about it because we all love it so much. And so some of the topics that we're going to cover, we'll, we'll throw the, the sermon schedule up on the screen. You'll see behind me what it is that we're going to be covering. I hope that some of that resonates with you in that you'll not only attend, but you will invite someone that you know who loves change as much as you do to come and participate that, in that as well. God is not absent from change. God works through the change. We want to invite you to come back and participate in that. On the inside of the worship guide, you'll see that congratulations and condolences are in order. So let's remember the family of Sue Dowden. Sue passed away this last week. And so if you know members of her family, please reach out to her. She was a precious part of this congregation for, for many, many years. Her and her, she and her husband, Ed. Also, we want to congratulate Ron and Billy Henderson. They're celebrating their 34th wedding anniversary. So right back there. And Larry and Margie Johnson are celebrating their ninth anniversaries right over there, so we're thankful for them. Once again, everybody, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we are choosing to rejoice and be glad in it. So we have much to be thankful for and much to give God honor and praise for. So we're glad that everyone is here. Now, if you would, please stand, find someone you haven't said hi to, and greet them with the love of Christ.
Amen. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, God of grace and God of glory. What an appropriate song as we prepare to confess our faith today. Sometimes we need a little bit of courage and a whole lot of grace because we are all human and we all fall short of God and, and we all sin. But Romans chapter 5 verse 8 reminds us of this promise. God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we can be forgiven because Christ has already paid the price. So in that spirit, I invite you to confess your sin before God silently to yourself in these moments. And now with humble hearts, let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we continue our prayer time, we invite you to lift up your joys, your concerns, anything that's on your heart today. And as we do, we will say together, Lord, hear our prayers. So what is it we can pray for this morning? Lord, hear our prayers. 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 Gracious and loving God, as we breathe in your Holy Spirit today, we acknowledge that you are already at work, that you are here and you are present. You have been with us every moment when we went to bed last night, while we slept, when we rose today. You are with us, God, and we trust in you. And in a spirit of trust, we pray for our brothers and our sisters at First United Methodist Church in Granbury and at Stonewater Church this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come and fill their hearts and that their ministry today would draw others closer to you. We pray also for our sisters and our brothers around the world who have gathered in St. Louis for General Conference as they begin their deliberations today. Gracious God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in all who are present and that your love would be made known through words and actions. Guide our church, gracious God and help us to fully trust you with the outcome. We pray for those that we have lifted up today, some spoken out loud and some whispered only in our hearts. Give us assurance, God, that you are with us always, that we can trust in you. We love you and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm going to give you a little insight into who I am really quickly. Because if you don't know, I have a fear of heights. Just an irrational fear of heights. This time last year, I was in London at St. Paul's Cathedral. And as I was climbing up the steps to St. Paul's Cathedral, all 500 and something of them, I was saying a prayer to myself over and over and over again. And it was, Lord, if I fall, let me die before I hit the ground. And then I started to think about the prayer that Pastor Wade was teaching us for the first time at this point last year. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it points in my life when I am not sure what's going on, when I am upset, when I am scared. I pray that prayer. I, I say those things that I believe. I reaffirm my faith in Jesus Christ because I find that it brings me a sense of peace and a sense of calm to claim those things that I believe. So this morning, would you stand and join me as we join 2,000 years of Christian history in repeating the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. This morning I want to share with you a story about generosity. And you actually watched it happen just a few moments ago. Every Sunday morning at 8.10, we have somebody come up and pray for our pastors, for our choir, for our whole church. This morning, it was Carson Diggs, and we appreciated him coming up and praying for us. And I know that many of you in this room have done it. And that's just one way that people show their generosity. But there's another way that you probably haven't seen, because it's on Wednesday mornings. On Wednesday mornings for the past several weeks... And on Tuesday evenings, really, I've been getting an email from our prayer team asking me and the other pastors to go on Wednesday morning and to be prayed over, for our families to be prayed over, for the staff to be prayed over, for our church, for you by name, to be prayed over. I think one of the most amazing ministries of this church is our prayer team. That every time something happens in our lives, you can send a prayer request to this church and you will have people whose job it is to sit in their prayer closet and to fight the battle for you. To intercede on your behalf with God. I remember many years ago, my mother, when she had cancer, would tell people she was having a really bad day and she would, in 30 minutes, after sending a prayer request out, be able to tell herself, you know what? This may be a bad day, but I know who's won the victory. When we pray for people, we do it because we know that Jesus is listening. We do it because we know that where two or more are gathered in his name, even if they're not together, Jesus is there. Jesus is listening. And our call as a church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And we do that first through prayer, through interceding with God, and then through our actions. So this morning as you give, remember that generosity. And please keep your church in your prayers this week. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks that you've gathered us here today. God, as we give back to you now, help us to give freely. God, open us to you, that we may be a part of what you've already been doing. God, we may see your plans come to fruition. As we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Ushers.
may be seated. I want to thank the choir. That was phenomenal. Appreciate that. And Blake, great job playing also. We can give God thanks for them this morning and doing that. Today was the final sermon in this series on uh, it being in the potter's hands. And as I come before you today, I acknowledge that there's a lot of good in the world. Amen? There's also a lot of bad in the world. Amen? Amen. So yesterday, an example of some good things. Yesterday, I was at a school competition for my son, Caleb, who is nine years old. And he's part of a group called Odyssey of the Mind, or some people know it as Destination of the Imagination. And it was a school competition. We went over to South Lake Carroll and, and some groups from Acton Elementary and some groups from other schools in the area got together. And they were in a competition of the mind. It was pretty awesome. And it was good. They had a great time. Uh, I enjoyed visiting with folks I hadn't been able to visit with before because like any school outing that you take with your kids, there's always a lot of hurrying up and waiting. And so there's a lot of time for visitation, and I appreciate that as well. I was able to visit with some people in the church who also had kids there that I hadn't really had a chance to visit with before. So that was awesome, and the weather was great. And I'm thinking about this last week in addition to yesterday and just the different conversations that I've had and, and you know, the things that Michelle and I were able to converse about and, and talk about and hang out together. I mean, it's been a good week, and, you know, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And, and then getting ready for this morning, you know, coming here and People Matter Sunday. I'm super pumped and excited about that this morning and the new partner dinner. And, you know, I just, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff. But there's a lot of bad stuff also. Uh, for example, last night, Rebecca, our seven-year-old, she was complaining about stomach ache. Do I need to go any further about that? But the st stomach ache. And Michelle was actually out of town on a crafting retreat with her lady friends. And so she was out of town. So I was just being the daddy last night. She was complaining about stomach ache. And then all of a sudden, about 9 o'clock, everything happened. All right. So at that point, so we had a good day. And then the end of the day, it wasn't so hot. And Michelle hadn't it, come in from her retreat and so there was that and I think she was feeling better this morning she was still asleep when I left and you know that was kind of a bad thing she wasn't feeling great about it and then also this week I had some conversations with uh, someone in the community who was having marital trouble and he didn't know where else to go so he contacted us and I was able to visit with him and and I can tell you for for him and his family right now things aren't always looking really rosy right now and I also heard conversations where some, some conversations with other church people that they'd had with other church people, some trust was broken because they felt like some things were being said that weren't really true and they found out later. And, you know, when church people don't act like church people should act, then it really hurts church people. I don't know if y'all know that or not, but it, it, it can be really hurtful. And, and, and so there's, there's good in the world, but then there's also some bad stuff that happens as well. And yet the whole time we're meant to be in the potter's hands. And so what do we do with this thing called brokenness? What do we do with this thing called sin? When there's both good and bad, do, do, we, do we sweep it under the rug? Do we ignore it? Do, do we lay claim to it and use it as something to prop up and, and be boastful about that just say, well, that's just the way I am? Or, or is there something more about this brokenness and about this sin as we find ourselves in the, in the potter's hands? Is brokenness the final word? I want to visit with you about that this morning. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for each of the broken pieces that are here this morning, including myself, Lord. Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will mend us, you will heal us, Lord. We pray for a Holy Spirit healing and anointing this morning, Lord, body, mind, and spirit. Lord, that, that, that brokenness which seems to identify us and lead us and sometimes not make great decisions and mar the good that's in the world, Lord, I pray that you will bring your healing as we submit to your loving hands as clay on the potter's wheel. Lord, lead us over these next few moments so that we might grasp what it is that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
So in order to talk to you about your brokenness and sin, I have to acknowledge that, that I'm a little bit cracked and I have brokenness and sin as well. I won't, I won't lay out the litany of how I am broken and sinful. We, there's not enough time this morning to do all that list that I have. But I speak to you as a fellow cracked pot, okay? And so we're all in this thing together. And as I'm trying to figure out if brokenness is the final word or how does the Holy Spirit work through that brokenness, I, I keep on coming back to one of the letters in the New Testament from 2 Corinthians uh, particularly chapters 3 and chapter 4. And I, uh, look, I've got, I've got no new material. I just want to tell you that. Uh, the, the, I have no new material. I just rely on the material that's already been provided, and I get to talk about it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want to share some, some bits and pieces with you from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4 to help understand this brokenness and sin and and I know God worked in and through this in my life this week, and I trust he will do the same thing through you all this week. Are you, are you ready? Are you ready for God to do something in you this morning, or are you just kind of waiting until you get to go out and have donuts and coffee? Yeah, some of us who are broken, we're just waiting for the donuts and coffee, right? We don't really want God to heal, but you might be surprised today. So if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and you look at verses 16 through 17, Paul is talking to the Corinthians. They're, they're Christians just like you and me. And he's talking about the, the expansiveness of God's grace and, and how before we understand God's grace, it's like a veil is placed over our eyes. We can't really see the things of God. I know of, I've been in that situation. I still find myself, myself in that situation from time to time. I'm still a work in progress. I imagine that for many of us, we have those times where it's like we look back and go, wow, a veil was lifted up, and now I can see things more clearly. Well, here's what the Apostle Paul told to the Christians in Corinth. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? It'd probably be good if we, if we had the, the right scripture here. So here it goes. Uh, da, 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 da. But even whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit, and the spirit of the Lord, there is the word is freedom. And the word is? Yeah, there you go. And so when we're talking about brokenness and sin, there's something that we all need to understand, even as, as Christian folk, is that you're never going to find the healing. You're never going to find the wholeness. You're never going to find what you're looking for with a form of godliness that lacks the power of godliness through Jesus Christ. There's not a one of us in the room that can live into the grace of Jesus Christ without continually receiving the grace of Jesus Christ. That when we turn to Jesus, the veil is taken away. And when we live into Jesus, what God has done for us through Jesus, then we're not held in slavery anymore, but we have freedom in Christ. When I think about my brokenness, and when I think about my sin, and when I think that I'm a cracked pot, what gives me hope is not just my, my ability to reason and to sum up my own strength and rely on my family history and go, look, I've got this, i just got to work harder and I can do this. No, what gives me hope as a cracked pot, is that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And not freedom to do whatever I want to do, but freedom to live into the way that Christ created me to be in in the first place. That's the freedom that we are called to have. And a veil is taken away. So as I'm thinking about all the good in the world and I think of all the bad in the world, I recognize my own self that there are times when I'm really, really good and there's other times that I'm really, really bad. And I don't have it within me to become what I was created to be until I've turned to Christ. Day in, day out, continually. Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, so therefore, as he's talking about this, therefore, since God's mercy, we have this ministry, he and the other folks that are in ministry with them, we do not lose heart. And I think that's really important for us as Christian folks, that, that Christianity is meant to be dynamic and it's meant to be active. It's not meant to be just a part of our history, but it's meant to, to propel us today, right now, wherever you are, that because of that, through God's mercy, this ministry that we have, we cannot 
just fall into the, to the traps of uh, the cul-de-sacs of despair. But we are called to not lose heart because of who we are through Jesus Christ. I think as we talk about brokenness and being in the potter's hands, that, that we have this great encouragement and assurance through Christ that, that we don't have this hope so, think so, maybe so faith, but that, but that we are encouraged not to lose hope because we know who wins. We know who claims the victory. And some of us were really torqued up. That's the, that's the theological term, torqued up. We're really torqued up about what might or might not happen at the denominational level. Others of us church stuff, denominational stuff, or stuff in your family, or stuff with your finances. You're all torqued up about all these things, and you're, and you're losing heart. You're losing faith. You're losing confidence. You're losing assurance. That's not who you were called to be through Christ. You're not called to be someone who loses heart. You're called to be someone who stands on the victory of Jesus Christ. That, that even with whatever decision is made in St. Louis, you know what's going to happen here at the church? We're going to keep on making disciples of Jesus Christ and loving people. You can get worried about all those other things if you want to. And they're important things. But our ministry doesn't change to love all people. And we're going to keep on loving all people because the best indicator of what we're going to do in the future is not our talk and it's not our thoughts. It's what we've done in the past. So you can get torqued up if you want, but I'm choosing not to lose heart because the church is God's idea. Christ is the head. And our job is to play follow the leader. Also, Paul goes on to say in verses 5 through 6, and I, and I love this. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants. He's talking about the Corinthians. It's, it's we preach Christ and we are your servants. We're called to be servant leaders to you, not just tell you what you need to do, but show you through example that, that we mutually submit to one another. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And he, and he goes on to say this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Now, now in church world, you, you know we're, we're supposed to lay ourselves bare, right? That, that we are to come and we are to confess and we are to, to, to not put on any airs and we're not to wear any masks and, and we're to come in as if we're children of the Lord and we're coming to, to sit on the lap of our, of our good father and we're called to be embraced like a, like a loving mother and, and we're just called to come and be healed and to be loved, Right? And so when we come in here, if we try to put on a mask or we try to assume something different than we are, then we're not really worshiping, we're just kind of play acting. So with that being said, how many of you in this room feel that you are perfect? How many of you feel like, like you have more knowledge than everyone else, and so you can exercise judgment towards other people in ways that, that probably couldn't? happen otherwise no that's great that you acknowledge that you are not that way because we are all imperfect and the same measure we use to judge others will be the same measure that is used to judge us so when when Paul says that we have these treasures in jars of clay it means that we're cracked and we're and we're messed up and 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 we, we try to discern what it means to, to live like Christ does. It doesn't mean that, that you are made better when I try to give off errors that I'm perfect, and, and I'm not better when you try to put off errors that you are perfect. But Paul says, because we're broken people, both good and bad, that we are jars of clay. So that the glory of God, the surpassing knowledge of God might be displayed. And then I love what he says here. He acknowledges this. That we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And I love that because he's acknowledging that even though we are jars of clay and our hope is in the Lord, there's still a struggle. You know that there's a struggle. I know that there's a struggle, not just within personally, but with us, when we live together, 
Have y'all ever struggled with living a Christian life with the people that are on your left and the people that are on your right? Yeah, I have. I've also struggled inwardly with following Christ because I'm a cracked pot. But Paul is saying, look, we, can, we, can, we, are, we are blessed but not cursed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. And that's where our hope is. There, there's a Japanese form of, of art. It's called kintsugi. And kintsugi is a, a way of fixing broken pottery uh, with special lacquer dusted with powdered gold and, and silver and platinum. And what it does is this repair method celebrates each artifact's unique history, emphasizing its fractures and breaks instead of hiding or disguising them. And I've got a picture of it here up on the screen. Everyone say kintsugi. This is not in the scripture, okay? You won't find this word in the scripture. It's a Japanese form of art. But I want you to look at this cracked pot. It's almost like this form of, of pottery is really embracing what Paul said that, that even though we're, we're jars of clay and we're cracked pots, we, we focus on the surpassing power of God so that through our weakness, God's strength might be made known. And imagine those gold lines that you see in that piece of pottery. That those are the bonds of grace. That when you think back on your own life and you think that there are things that you don't want anybody to know about, you don't want to talk about, you want to turn your corner, you don't want to deal with it, you want to sweep it under the rug. And if anybody knew really how you were right now as you sit, if they really knew who you were, they would shun you and they wouldn't want to have anything to do with you. I want to encourage you to not lose hope. Because we believe in a Lord that mends the broken pieces. And then when God mends the broken pieces, it's the threads of God's grace that weave us together. Paul goes on to say, at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says this. Once again, therefore do not lose what? Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Now, here are a couple of things we can do with this message or with this passage of Scripture. Forget the message, just focus on the Scripture. Here's a couple of things we will do with this Scripture because we both struggle with the things that we know we ought to do, but yet we do the very things we know we shouldn't do. That's an old story. Some of us are going to take this Scripture reading and go, I, you know what, I'm not going to do anything with that. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to give my life to Christ. I'm not going to try to lean in. You know, that was nice. It was a different sermon. I really didn't get it, but I'm ready to go eat some donuts and have some coffee and go to my Sunday school. That's always our choice. Always. But it's also a choice to come and go, that's my story. I am a cracked pot. I am a broken piece, and I'm mixed and mingled with other broken pieces. How am I going to lean in? to the threads of grace that God is using through Jesus Christ to mend me and us all together. That question leads you to discovery. By ignoring it, you've actually settled for something less than what God created you for. So this week, I've encountered both good and bad, both on the outside and on the inside. But I'm choosing today that brokenness will not have the final word in me or in those things around me. What are you choosing today? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. amen. As we consider what it means to, to go out as cracked pots healed by the grace of Jesus Christ, both personally and with others, we want to invite you to stand and sing. Lead on, O King Eternal. After we sing, uh, Amy's going to give us the benediction. And as you leave today, once again, we want to remind you to go to the gym to experience that people matter. Let us stand and sing.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, lead us on. Heal us in our cracked and broken pots as only you can. Make something beautiful from our brokenness. Give us assurance of your strength, and may we go in peace today. Amen.